Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor. And in this game, you are playing a 4X game with your tribe against not one, but two other rival factions as you compete cooperatively to defeat your enemies. You're going to basically be choosing a player board along with your player standee and your units, along with, of course, your havens, and you're going to start on a specific space on the board, in which case you're going to move around the board, gather new havens and more resources, use those resources to place units down, and gather new items, face quests, complete territories, and gain control of them, as well as defeating arch nemesises and uh, chaos members and imperial members of the two different warring factions that are not only against you and your teammates, but are against each other as well. And your objective is, at the end of three or four rounds, to have the most victory points over the chaos and imperium. Now, the chaos is fighting to have the most, and so is the imperium, and if either one of those gets over the victory point total of any other player, then that faction is going to win. The only way you can win is if everybody is higher in victory points than the two other rivaling slash opposing factions that are your enemies. Of course, with the Nemesis expansion here, the Arch Nemesis expansion, you will be including Arch Nemesis, and you will be utilizing them at the end of the game based on omens that you draw, and they're going to be going onto the board and you're going to be fighting them, which are even more challenging. You can increase the game difficulty by moving it from normal to hard to apocalyptical and adding new items like events, of item cards, specific types of quests, as well as as unique characters that are going to pop into the game and curses. And that's basically the idea of the game. Will you survive? Will you conquer territory and be the one to hold victory over the realm opposed to the other two warring factions? Find out in the game, Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor. Let's take a look at the game, how to set it up and how to play, and then finally my review. Okay, so the setup for this game is actually rather long, but I'll try and do my best to explain it. And the first thing I'm going to do is take out all of the additional advanced mode gameplay options, such as tiles, items, quests, and events, as well as you can set aside the Arch Nemesis for your first gameplay. And with the rest of the items is what you're going to use to set up the game board. First thing you'll do is take out the game board and place it on the table, the quest board, set it next to it, and then of course the Chaos slash Imperial board and set it next to that. So you'll have a huge game board gameplay experience. Then you're going to go ahead and take out all the quests, shuffle them, place them on the quest stack. Take out one of each event, shuffle them all up, uh, shuffle all the events deck, take one of each and place it on the events from ordered one, one, two, three, and four. All the items are shuffled as well and place three of them in their spots. And then of course, give every single player a player board, their player standee or their character, all their character char uh, all their character units and place them in their areas, as well as their havens and place them on the haven spots on their board. Each player is going to have a character deck of feats. You're gonna get two of them to start the game off with and they have the start icon located in the middle of the section. One player is gonna get the first player marker and all the victory point trackers are going to go on zero as as well as the Chaos and the Imperium. Uh, you're also going to be going ahead and uh, getting any uh, character that you choose. They have a double-sided, so you can choose either character you want, which is going to have unique dice for quests, as well as, of course, a player reference board. Uh, place your character on the game board after you set it up. How it works is you place the capital in the middle, place all of the unexplored hexes around based on how the map tells you to place them, as well as unexplored sea towers. Then place your haven, the first one on your left-hand side, onto your character's starting capital area, also explained in setup, along with your character hero standee. You're also going to be placing a three stacked um, one of these garrisons here in the middle on the capital which is for the Imperium as well as a one stacked uh, one of these guys here on each of the current ends. The Chaos are going to start with two curses as well as some skeletons based on the mode of gameplay and then you're going to have one druid card in each of the four spaces along the game board. The rest of the druid cards can also go away. On the Imperium board I just went ahead and or Chaos board I went ahead and placed all the rest of the stuff which is going to be the Horde and, and uh, Imperial decks you're going to place a certain number of these cards onto the deck based on the number of players. And you might be fighting six, seven, eight, nine of these guys here, depending on how many players are in the game. All the dice I've set aside over there as well, you'll be utilizing those. The activation tokens for Chaos and for the uh, Imperials. You're going to place all the curses and all the skeletons as well. And I went ahead and placed all the garrisons, walls, and towers over there so that you can utilize them for your havens, which are going to be nice because they're going to stack on and give you some type of benefit. Everything else, such as the resources will be set aside somewhere for within easy reach of all players. And of course, each player is going to get five of each unique resource, whether it be salt, food, 
or whether it be the supplies. Um, after that, place it somewhere within easy reach, as well as, of course, the threat token trackers and, of course, your action points. Each hero is going to get eight of them to start the game off with, and you'll set them off of their hero board within easy reach so that when you utilize them, you'll move them onto the hero board because you're going to getting, be getting eight back every single time you start a new event chapter. Uh, and then you're basically ready to play. You've got your hero board, you've got your character, and, of course, your haven on the specific area, all your units, your feet cards, your feet deck, and your havens ready to go. And, of course, the bad guys do as well with their two decks the Chaos and the Imperial deck ready to go as well. The last thing I guess if you don't remember to make sure you go ahead and drop out three quests in the quest pool area. These are the ones that you're going to be fighting throughout the game and of course you'll be getting new ones as each chapter unfolds. Uprising is played over chapters and you can play three or four chapters it's really up to you uh, but based on the last chapter that will trigger something unique whether you're playing with the expansion or just the base game. The base game is going to give each of the bad guys an extra activation marker and the expansion is going to to allow you to deal with omens that will summon unique types of units called arch nemesis and uh, you can get one or even two of them onto the game board which you'll have to deal with in the last chapter but how it works is pretty simple you're going to start with this chapter track it's on the very far left hand side board and it goes all the way down you're going to use this little marker here to go down that board and follow all of the steps in order making it very very streamlined and very easy to understand how to play but there's a ton of content going in and so you'll take each step individually and make sure you have the rule book handy. The first thing you're going to do is reveal a druid card. You'll take one of these druid cards, you'll flip it over, and that will be your god mode card that activates whenever you roll a, ex uh, a lightning bolt whenever you're in combat. And that is going to give you some type of benefit throughout the game. And you're going to get multiples of these guys, hopefully, that last throughout the entire game, that will allow you to utilize them and choose which one you want to use based on when you roll that lightning bolt. Uh, you're also then going to flip over any face down cards face up, ignore this for the first round, get eight action point markers like I explained to start the game off with. You're going to deal out three new item cards from the item deck as well as three new quests, but for the first game mode you don't have to worry about that either. And then you're of course going to pass the first player marker to the left, but for the first game mode you won't worry about that as well. Uh, then you're going to do the event phase. Uh, you're going to add two threat to every legion, and each legion has a character card. These are basically big baddies that you're going to have to deal with, and of course a threat marker. And based on the event it will determine what their threat is to start with, which I'll explain in a second, but let's just say that he has a threat of four. During this phase, you'll move it to a threat of six, and you'll do that for every single one of these characters that is still on the board. And of course, for the first mode of the game, or the first round, chapter, etc., you are not going to have to worry about increasing the threat on these guys, but you will each additional one as long as there are any on the board that have not been neutralized. You are then going to go ahead and uh, have the first player draw and read the next event. You'll draw the event card. Only one will be present uh, from the event board on chapter one, and you'll do what it says. There's a first portion and a second portion. The first will have us interact in some way. The second will have baddies spawn on the table. There's a threat icon which tells you how much threat the baddies will have, which in this case will be four. And then after you finish doing that, you'll move on to the next phase, which is going to be to place an activation token on every horde and legion card um, on the last chapter and do this twice. Uh, so you're basically going to be giving those characters abilities to improve their movement and actions throughout the game. Then you're going to move on to the build phase. The build phase is actually really simple. You're going to have a player board. I'll move this guy, all this stuff off so you can see exactly what it does. On the player board, there is going to be things that you can buy and they're all represented right here. First, you can buy any of the units provided you can only place five on a space, and there's a cost to them, and the cost is in the bottom of each of them. For instance, if I wanted a stone shell, which is a basic warrior, it would cost me one supply and one of these salt tokens. I spend those, I place my units on one of my havens, as long as I have less than five units there. I can also go ahead and place out towers and defenses, which also have costs. When you place a tower, um, or I should say a wall, uh, or a tower on a haven, it works pretty simple. You have this haven here in your hand, you'll place the wall around it, and the tower will go right on top, thusly giving you a fortified haven to protect you in combat when baddies come onto your space. And that's basically it. Units, walls, and towers. After everybody has built, and this works all simultaneously, every single player in the game, all the non-NPC uh, characters will do this, you'll move on to the action phase. And the action phase is also very streamlined as well. You have eight action tokens, and you can utilize them for all the actions here. 
Every action costs an action token, and any action that you do other than moving or trading is going to end your turn. And uh, you can choose to move, which is moving to an adjacent space, with your standee, which does not count as a unit, so it doesn't count as one of the five on the space, and it can go literally anywhere on the board. And as it moves around, it's going to be able to trade, which is going to let you get one salt for a trade action and trade with anybody on your space. You can command units utilizing one food to move any units in opposing spaces onto a hex of your choosing as long as it has been revealed. Uh, you can explore, which is to reveal a hex. You're going to take a hex that you are currently on with your character, flip it over, do whatever it says, and gain the benefit rewards and, of course, negatives. And then you're going to have a haven. Havens where you spend your supplies to then be able to build a haven from the left and most side of your board onto that space as long as it is empty. The market phase, uh, market trading is going to let you buy one of these guys as long as you can A, utilize it based on your stats, and B, pay for it with the salt. You can have up to 10 feats and items. And then, of course, there's the quest. Questing will let you choose any of the quest cards, utilizing them to roll your hero dice based on your hero card, and attempting to succeed at one or more of these requirements. In this case here, we have a skull, we have a shield, and we have two lightning bolts. If you can accomplish any of these three, you will succeed at this card specifically, but if you can do more, you can get bonus small ob objectives, you can get the main solve, and if you fail, you'll suffer the, pe suffer the penalty. There's also a bonus, depending on where your hero is, to where you will get this extra die when rolling. So not only will you get uh, two blue, one of it your choice of white or yellow, and a purple when trying to fight this quest, but if your hero is on a woods hex, you'll get an extra one of these yellow dice and hopefully succeed these cards here. Whether or not you succeed will determine what the card does. It could discard and draw a new quest out. It could stay on the board. Really check the card text to see what it does. But most of the, case, most of the time, in most cases, the card will get discarded and you'll flip over a new quest. And I also extremely recommend that you just flip the quest over when you discard it so that you can tell the difference between a quest that has been discarded and one that is currently in play. And those are basically all the different quests or actions you can do on your turn. You perform the move and command, or move and explore, move and haven, move and market, move and quest, and uh, that would end your turn. If you choose to do any of those other ones that isn't move and trade, it would just end your turn, and you'll spend your action points, and one at a time going around the board until you're empty. If you're empty, you stop, and everybody continues until no one has any more actions left to do. Thusly, moving their characters around the board, moving their heroes around the board, and trying to get the best positioning possible. You can never have your units on somebody else's space, and if you ever have your units in an enemy space, you instantly start a fight, which I'll explain later. Uh, after that is the Nemesis phase, and the Nemesis phase works like this. You're going to activate your Legions and Horde monsters based on their initiative, and it'll be on the top le right hand, left hand side to determine which one goes first. You'll start from lowest to highest. You go, hey, there's a one initiative and there's a 30. Well, the one will go first and then the 30. And most of these guys function in a pretty specific way, and it's in the rulebook. The hordes are always trying to move to the Imperium's capital, but will always stop along the way to destroy your, your specific little havens and, of course, your units. And the Imperium are always branching out, targeting specific individual players, moving their characters, or moving their Imperium units, NPCs, towards the characters like havens to destroy them. And you're going to have to deal with them as they target you specifically. And after they've all activated, then you're going to move on to the next phase. But remember, whenever these guys pop on the board, there's a unique effect to them. They have a unique unique uh, combat role when it comes to range, when it comes to the basic clashing, which is melee. And then, of course, they give you a benefit when you defeat them, which is usually, usually going to result in victory points. Finally, there is going to be the production phase before the scoring phase, which will allow you to gain resources. You'll gain resources for whatever, however many havens you have when you look in your player board, as well as for each haven you have on the main board of the game, it will give you resources as well. Everybody can just collect all those resources that they gather, that they get, and put them in a supply area next to their game board. And finally, a scoring phase. And it works pretty simply. The Empire is going to get, uh, the Imperial Graveyard is going to, or the Imperial Legion, the em Empire I like to call it, is going to get points based on each faction that it defeats, how many of these garrisons are on the field, and um, some other unique uh, ways to gain points, and so forth with the Chaos as well. The Chaos will gain points for the different factions in their graveyard, however many curses are on the field, etc, etc. And finally, you will score points as well. You will get points for each of your havens that are currently on the board. You're going to get points... Um, for each of your havens that are on a space that give you points, and you can also get points for spending resources. And after you've gone through all of that, if you're playing the base game, you're done. You go back to the next chapter, and you fully rinse and repeat. 
However, if you're playing with the expansion, there is a omens phase. You will roll your dice, you will see what you get, just like a quest, and then you will draw an omens tile, whether it be one or two, and that is going to determine what type of arch nemesis you'll be fighting at the end of the game, whether it be on chapter three or four, depending on the length of the gameplay. And that's basically how the game works, and you'll move on from there. Combat's pretty simple. Your characters are going to be what fight. You'll never fight with your hero. Your characters will have a die on them, and you'll associate those die with the characters and you'll roll for a ranged phase and then you'll clash until all units of one opposing faction are gone and when you fight you're always fighting the lowest initiative first you might be able might be fighting more than one character at the same uh, in at different times like you might fight skeletons first and you might fight uh, the specific horde or you might fight one imperial legion and then another imperial legion and it's until one character's units or one faction's units is completely gone. You will say, let's say that you have, I don't know, uh, three red characters with three red dice and a purple one and a black one. These are what you roll. And then of course the opposing faction will roll their dice based on whatever their card is. And they'll take damage by reducing their threat. If it gets to zero, they're dead. And we'll take damage by reducing our characters from by, by one for each of the skulls that we get dealt. There are three types of abilities on the dice. One is going to be a skull. Skull means damage. The other one is going to be a shield, and a shield means defense, so it prevents the damage from a skull. And then finally, you are going to have the exclamation point. I keep saying exclamation points, but what I mean to say is lightning bolts. And lightning bolts are also shields, or you can utilize them as one of the druid powers, but check to make sure how many times you can use that in each combat phase or in each round. And they'll do some type of benefit as well. And then you're just going to deduct the difference. If it's three attack and one shield, then only one attack will get through. If it's two attack and two attack, then two attacks go through on each side. One player is going to lose two units, and then of course the chaos or the imperial character is going to lose two threat. And if you're able to reduce all of the units to zero, uh, by the end of combat, you succeed. If they wipe out all of units, of your units, they succeed. And they're going to score points at the end for that. And it just rinses and repeats. You're going to flip over a new chapter deck after you go through the um, refresh phase. You'll read this. You'll add more units to the board. You'll go through and do your building and your actions. The nemesis action phase will activate. The hordes and legions will go. And then, of course, you'll produce. And finally, you will add points up until you get to the last phase, which is either going to be three or four, depending on how long you want to play the game. And you'll check to see victory points. And it's going to be pretty simple. If a board looks like this, where all the players are ahead of the bad guys, you all win collectively. However, if at least just one of the bad guys is ahead of any of you, then that bad guy specifically wins the game. So you always have to be working together to make sure that you're ahead of the competition, working by trading and whatnot, but also remember that you're kind of working alone because you're not able to help in combat in any way. You're mainly gonna be helping in trading, staying out of other people's ways and working together to make sure that the bad guys not only fight each other, which can happen, but also fight players that they probably will lose to. Anyway, that is the game Uprising. Curse of the Last Emperor, explained in a nutshell, but of course there's a little bit more detail than that. Let's go ahead and talk about my review. Well, damn, I have a lot to say about this game. Uh, this game is massive, first of all. There's a ton of table space required, and my table space barely permitted three players, so expect to have a large table presence, and expect to have um, a need for additional space for each additional player, because it can play up to five players. And uh, one thing I noticed too is that the number of players doesn't change the game all that much, other than adding more Chaos Hordes and Imperial Legions to the stack here, making it a little more challenging, I suppose. But the characters themselves don't get any stronger or any weaker based on the additional player count you add. So you're just going to have more bad guys as it comes up. You can change the difficulty of the game. We played this the first time on literally the most apocalyptic way we could play it. We played it on the most challenging because we thought adding the advanced stuff was just going to make for a more advanced game. No, advanced means advanced and it means harder as well. So be aware of that when you get this game. If you do not want to play a very, very, very challenging game to set aside all of those pieces. And to do so, you'll just have to note that each of the ones that have an advanced mode is going to have a skull on it, which you think would have made me realize that when setting the game up. Uh, take these guys out. They're going to be in all of the different hexes. They're going to be in the items and the quests and the events. And you probably will not want to utilize those because it will make the game very challenging, unless you want for a very challenging experience, which we 
kind of almost succeeded in because we kind of made the Imperium and Chaos kill each other when they all popped out. And they all popped out real quick. I was very surprised how many bad guys started popping out because of the game mode. Um, but luckily, because they do fight each other and they do gain points for doing so, uh, you will you can basically kind of manipulate the bad guys to hurt each other and thusly kind of leave you guys alone in some ways. They still have their own specific priorities, though. Other than mentioning the game's table presence, another thing to note, too, is the quality of this game. High quality. This is beautiful. I love the standees. They're stickered. They're thick. They're strong. They're sturdy. They work great. Do they need to be um, minis? Probably not because they take up so much space as it is on the game board and in the hexes and you can only have five units per hex. It would just start looking like a jarbled mess. I think they actually did a good job choosing these as opposed to the, uh, the, the miniatures. And not only that, they do represent and show you what type of die they utilize as opposed to looking on your player board. You can just look on the game board, which makes it very nice and they stand out and they look good. I really, really appreciate all the quality of this game, all the garrisons, all the walls and towers and how you can kind of stack them up on top of each other was really, really cool as well. And at first I didn't know what to do with these guys because I don't know, I'm just, I didn't think, but once you get these guys a little, oh, so cute, so cute, looks great. And then even your havens too, as I explained with you take the, the, the your little haven here, you can place your little walls and your tower, which makes it more, uh, more sturdy, gives you more attack. All the artwork in this game is fantastic. 10 out of 10 artwork. I really, really, really dig the artwork for this game. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite uh, pieces of art I've seen come out, at least uh, specifically this year, which, I mean, uh, maybe the last six months. We'll give it even more, uh, more of a length. I really, really, really like the artwork for this game. Um, the setup, it was fairly simple, fairly straightforward. I goofed on the uh, difficulty setting because literally anybody else would not have done so except for myself, so don't really worry about that all too much. Just take out all the bad stuff and play with how the book tells you to play with on normal difficulty for your first game mode. Do not play apocalyptical, apocalyptical unless you're looking for a beatdown, which apparently we were. <laughs> Um, uh, gameplay is smooth. It, it functions pretty straightforward. You have your little tracker and it goes down the little like scroll of listing of things. You really can't goof up in the game as far as how they, uh, how each phase functions uh, to a certain extent. Uh, some things can be a little more confusing like priority for where the Imperial Legion is going to go or where the Chaos Horde is going to move. Uh, there's like if not A then B and if not B then C and D and so on and so forth. And so you can be like do they move this way? And if so, can I move this guy to kind of force them to go a different way? And it does work like that, but you have to really read the rules, read the how they specifically path and where they're trying to get to. You have to understand that the purple units are always going towards their target and that the yellow units, the chaos, are always going towards the Imperium capital, trying to fight the other bad guys. But they're always willing to stop along the way and mess with your havens, to mess with your character units and whatnot. And so setting them up to fail is very important this game. Rolling the dice is fairly simple. Everything's really, really straightforward as to what happens and when it happens, and it's very, very detailed. It's everywhere, too. Even things like how do skeletons fight and how do garrison fights. They're literally on the board here. What the terrain does, because when you move on certain terrain pieces, there's certain bonuses and negatives that you're going to get when you are on those terrain pieces. Um, how you build things, where, when you build things, what actions you get, everything is detailed out somewhere, whether it be on a player reference, which even describes the type of dice that are available and what their sides are what the uh, combat does, the most overlooked rules is on one side, etc, etc. They did a great job doing that. So quality, excellent. The gameplay experience is very straightforward, very streamlined, except for a few, very few things involving things like pathing and certain types of things like uh, when you get your feet cards and your item cards, they last forever. Some of them turn sideways and can't be used again for a certain phase. Others can only be used once a chapter, but you're not going to discard them unless the card specifically says so. And do note that. Originally, I was like, wow, this is really powerful. I guess I only get to use this once. No, if it doesn't say discard it, you get to keep utilizing it every single phase or every single round or it gets discarded and it goes away. And it's usually something that involves re reviving or recurring units and whatnot. Okay, gameplay now. What do I think about the gameplay? This gameplay can snowball. It is a very, very high likelihood of you either decimating your opponents or getting decimated yourself. The Chaos Horde, the Imperial Legion are powerful. Their characters are all unique, very different styles of play. They're gonna be doing different things. But in general, if you are not prepared when one of those guys walks onto your specific field and they've been on the board for long enough, expect to get 
freaking messed up. You're going to lose all of your units, you're going to lose your havens, and it's going to decimate you. You're not able to build more than five units on a space. And if you start a chapter with a haven and five units on that space, you build nothing. You cannot build any more units because you have all the units present on that game board. So you have to account for that. You have to be prepared for the unexpected. And the unexpected is going to happen. Which means, on one end, yes, snowballing does suck. I'm not a big fan of that. But on the other end, this game has tension and a lot of it. You don't know what's going to happen next. You prepare the best as you possibly possibly can with your allies. You can't really work together, but you're not really working against each other either, and you kind of want to make sure everybody has the same number of points, so you can give people items, you can kind of uh, utilize certain tactics like trading with them when you have your hero on the same space as their hero, which is nice, but when it comes to fighting their battles for them, you cannot do so. You cannot protect them in any way. They have to be able to stand on their own two feet, because these factions do not trust each other yet, and so you're having them fight Imperium all by themselves. You have to kind of like go in there and work together by not actually working together in this game, which I would have liked to see a little more of that. But on the same instance, it didn't really bother me all that much. <laughs> and that's going to be the difference between A and B. A is snowballing, but B is fun, exciting gameplay that you never know what to expect. The dice are random. You could get nothing on your roll. You could get gangbusters on your roll. And the same can be said for the enemies as well. One turn could be an amazing turn for you. The other turn, you're decimated. You have been reduced to rubble, and you have to start back fresh. But don't worry. If you don't have a haven, that's okay. You're going to be able to still place units down on your turn. Yeah, you'll just select a space that has been unoccupied, and then bam, five units will go there. And when your action phase begins, you can put a haven there. So you're never down and out of the game. You're just down, but you're just not out. <laughs> um, other than the randomness, though, and the snowballing, what else? Uh, the Imperium and the Chaos Horde function differently, and the characters function differently. There's a ton of replayability in this game, more than you'll ever need. The quest deck is wonderful. I really, really enjoy it because it has so many different choices in it, and you don't always have to succeed in one way. There's more than one way to skin a cat type of thing. Mm -hmm. Not the greatest analogy, but uh, you'll be able to do different modes. Maybe I only need four skulls, or I need one shield, or I need two bolts, and I can do more than one of these. And some of them require me to do two of them, others require me to do one, but you get many benefits for them. You get a big benefit, and if you fail, there's a negative benefit. Some of these quest cards give you a ton of points. Others will give the enemy a ton of points. You might have just spent an action helping the enemy out. Wonderful. Or if you spent your action and it gave you a big amount of points, you're happy. So it's so, so swingy, and you never know what to expect, which is you know, one way or the other. Uh, you have items. These items will benefit certain characters at certain points in time. Sometimes you can get them even though you're not supposed to be getting them, but in general when you buy them you can't get them. Uh, until your stats improve. There's certain ways where your stats will improve based on your feats, based on other items in the deck. You'll buy these items and you can utilize them when they say to utilize them. And you can get 10 of these. Stockpile on these. These are going to be amazing for you. They're powerful, they're unique, they're very interesting, and they function for very specific characters in very specific ways. Sometimes you'll be able to use a card that it will protect you. We had one card that was amazing. Callie was able to rescue all of the guys who had been killed in the Imperium, Imperial Graveyard at the very end of a chapter, bringing them all back and stopping the Imperium from getting six whole points. That is massive, and these cards can do that for you. They can also be as useful, useful as not doing anything at all, because you can't utilize them because you don't have the stats for them. Uh, the chapters present unique and interesting uh, types of gameplay as well. You're going to have these event chapters that pop up in the game mode that will tell you to roll symbols, and if you fail, you'll suffer. And then, of course, you're going to suffer at the very end, too, because you're going to be adding uni units from Chaos, from the Imperium, onto the board, and whenever these guys hit the, the field, it feels like a boss is hitting the board. But now you have one, two, three, maybe even four bosses on the board at any point in time, and once you've killed them all, bam, they're back again in the next chapter, and there's a ton more to deal with, and they've gotten more difficult, they have more activations, and they can activate X number of times based on the amount of activations you have on them, which can be given to them from quests, they can be given them to events, and then of course every single time you play a chapter they're going to get some as well. And then you have the lightning bolts. Man, there's so much to talk about in this game. The lightning bolts. When you're playing combat, it's pretty straightforward. My, sh my shields versus your attack equals how much damage I take and vice versa. But when you roll a lightning bolt, it can be a shield or it could be draw an item from the deck and give it to any player, even if they can't use it once per uh, combat. Or maybe it's you may reroll any of your dice so that it does so that it does not show a lightning bolt. Maybe I want to switch a uh, specific die here. Maybe I have double lightning bolt and it's not going to help me in combat because the enemy doesn't have any uh, deep is not affected by lightning bolts. So I can change that to now a skull 
or maybe a skull and a lightning bolt for some reason if I wanted to do that. And so these druid cards, these god powers, will improve the gameplay, give you more of a chance of coming back. Some of them will give you victory points as you're playing. And the dice are all very simple, but they have their own unique styles to them. You'll have a choice as to opposed to what die you want to pick from, and that can benefit you in combat as well. Even garrisons are unique in their own way. You have to do three damage directly to them, which is different than any other type of combat, because most of the time when you do a damage, they lose a threat or you remove their unit. In this case, when you have a one, it's only one damage. Two, you need two, and three, you need all three to work, which means a garrison going in um, against you and you only have two dice, you're going to most likely lose unless you're playing with a black die, which is going to have three skulls on it. And that is for your best unit in the game, which all your units are the exact same, except they just reference a specific die and they're going to have a higher cost to them. Okay, I'm pretty much done gushing about this game because there's a whole lot to talk about. Now, um, I just want to give you an overall experience for my gameplay. When we were playing this game, originally I started out and I started feeling like, bam, this is probably an eight or a nine out of 10 in my opinion. Like I really, really, really enjoyed this game. And then as I got pummeled and pummeled and I lost certain things and uh, sometimes the die rolls didn't go in my way, I was like, maybe it's just a seven, I don't know. And then I continued playing and I got these big swings. I came back and I'm like, oh, it's a nine again. And it kept switching back and forth. And not really only that, but in addition, at the end of the gameplay, when I had realized I was playing on Apocalyptical, I was like, oh, that's why uh, we were getting crushed at certain points. And uh, a lot of my die rolls that were really lucky were what benefited us, but in general, we probably should have lost. So I guess I can't be too mad at the game. If you're prepared for a swingy, snowball-y experience, random experience to some extent with mitigation and die and utilizing items and whatnot and works cooperatively in a forex state with a beautiful board layout, a ton of board presence, but requires a board that's huge, big table, big, uh, you're gonna like this game. Um, if you don't mind any of those negatives, and there are a few of them, sometimes it might be potentially balanced issue. You could get completely wiped out. That's possible as well. Um, but otherwise, I think if you watch this review all the way through, you know what experience you're going to be getting. It's swingy. It's crazy. There's a ton of things happening. There's a ton of tension. And there's a lot of rules. This, pa this rule book's like 50 pages. Uh, plus, you're going to have to read the Nemesis, which I kind of explained to the most most parks, I didn't really play it all that much. I think like one or two games of the Nemesis in it. But, uh, you know, I think you're getting a good idea just from this. So you can kind of skip through the 50 something pages if you've watched this video and I've done the work for you. And hopefully that helps. Maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, but basically, that's the game. Uh, did I enjoy this game? Yes. Am I going to keep it at my eight or a nine? Yeah, I am. I really did enjoy this game. This game we'll see play again. It's basically to me um, a cooperative Heroes of Land, Sea, and Air. It's kind of what I'm going to relate it to. And I had a ton of fun. This is going to sit right next to that game. And then when somebody asks for a Forex, I'm going to say cooperative or competitive. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Uprising Curse of the Lost Emperor. If you're interested in taking a look at the game, there's a link down below in the description where you can pick up this cooperative 4x game, something I've never really experienced before. So yeah, it's definitely staying in my collection. Now, our website is unfilteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter list, and more. You can go ahead and check that out on the link down below and see what we're giving away this week, as well as, of course, reviews there, which we do differently than the ones here on this channel. So you're not going to see the same game reviewed more than once. And if you do, it's not going to be by me. Now, uh, you can also go ahead and check out our live stream every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST. We play games just like this one, and we play them uh, and give away games as well. We have a spinner. We have this this little thing here where we do the little raffle and we spin the thing and we see if you want to win a game and we do that every Sunday it's a lot of fun we have a lot of people over usually it has anywhere from like four to six people playing games like party games and games like this one so if you want to join us that'd be great we're looking for more people to show up and watch us and uh, check out the games that are available for you to purchase there as well as of course win your own game for free that we donate to you guys all right guys that's all I got for you this time please subscribe like and comment hit that button and as always I look forward to dealing with the curse of the last emperor with you next time